Hello and welcome to today's webinar on achieving UDI compliance. Um, we're expecting the presentation today to last around 45 to 50 minutes and this will be followed by a Q&A session at the end. Um, please note that during today's sessions we will be meeting the telephone lines um, except for the speakers. So if you do have any questions, please submit them at any time using the, the question tool um, that you'll see on the screen in front of you. Um, so we'll be collating all of those questions at the end. Um, we'll look to get through as many as we can in, in the time that we've got left. And we'll also provide a, a written response to delegates of the questions that we've had come in. Um, following the presentation, we'll also be uh, making available a copy of the audio um, from today and, and also the slides. Um, so do keep a lookout for an email to tell you how and when you can access those details. So I will now introduce um, today's speakers. So we're joined today by two specialist speakers. Um, we've got firstly Jay Crowley, um, VP of UDI Solutions. and services from USCM. Um, so Jay was most recently senior advisor for patient safety in the FDA's Center for Devices and Radiological Health. And um, Jay developed the framework and offered key requirements for the FDA's UDI system. Um, we're also joined by Hal Plant, um, US Business Development Manager for Prism ID. And Hal has over 12 years experience in helping medical device and, and life science organizations with greater control, visibility, and efficiencies throughout their labeling operations, whilst also ensuring FDA compliance. Um, and Hal helps clients identify potential risks to compliance and also to quantify opportunities for cost savings whilst also making sure they meet their own labeling demands and also those mandated by regulatory um, agencies such as the FDA. Um, so just very briefly, um, the agenda for today's session. Um, so firstly, uh, we're going to cover off why, um, why UDI, um, talk through some of the considerations in ensuring compliance, and also um, look a little bit about controlling the process in the labeling life cycle to manage the data. Um, and then finally, it'll be how you can incorporate UDI into overall quality, compliance, and risk management strategy. Uh, and the guys will also talk through some, some suggestions in preparation. Um, so what I'm going to do now is hand over to our first speaker, which will be um, Jay Crowley. So uh, thank you very much, Jay, and uh, over to you. Great. Thank you, Anita, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, look forward to the opportunity to chat with you all about uh, what is going on in the world of unique device identification, or UDI. Um, as Anita mentioned, um, we've got some uh, uh, relatively short presentations. I'm going to go through um, UDI at a, at a fairly high level, uh, cover some of the major components of the uh, U.S. Uh, FDA's uh, UDI regulation. Um, if you've got any other questions or, or, or you want some more information, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My contact information is listed here. Hopefully we are all on slide five. Um, and uh, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, <clears throat> as hopefully most of you know, um, the UDI regulation uh, in the U.S. did publish um, in September of last year. Um, and uh, that began the compliance timeline, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, the, uh, the publication of the final rule was the culmination of, of years of work that went into the development of, of FDA's regulation. Um, and um, and the, uh, the work there uh, continues um, to this date. Uh, you all will have to excuse me for one half of one second. Sorry about that. Uh, my um, my slide didn't advance, but now it looks like hopefully it will. Um, always something with technology. Uh, okay, I'm going to, or if someone can advance. Uh, there we go. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, always, always fun with technology. Um, so uh, that uh, that that's the slide there. Slide uh, on the UDI timeline. Um, 
And now if we move on to slide, uh, and I do want to point out, sorry, at the end of uh, slide six, uh, there was a discussion of the IMDRF guidance document. Um, I do want to draw your attention to the work that's been gone, going on globally as well. Uh, if you have not had a chance to visit the IMDRF website and take a look at that guidance document, I, I also suggest that you do that. Um, slide seven is a, a review of the legislation uh, in the U.S., uh, the mandate that the U.S. Congress gave FDA to develop a UDI system. Uh, there are two portions, some of which was uh, required in the FDA Amendments Act of 2007, uh, essentially instructing FDA to develop a UDI system. Uh, in 2012, Congress amended that uh, implementing legislation, um, and the only really important part now uh, was a new implementation time frame, something that had not been talked about prior to the FDA Safety and Innovations Act. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what we call the FIDASIA timeline. So there are certain devices that are subject uh, within two years, uh, so by September 24th of 2015. There are a number of benefits, uh, we believe, uh, that can accrue uh, once a, a UDI system uh, is, is fully implemented. Um, there are a number that are listed here. I, I'm sure that there are other, both public health as well as business benefits that you can imagine. Um, there are <clears throat> a number of drivers for the adoption and implementation of UDI. But what I really want to do um, is to draw your attention to what I believe uh, it was, is, and was uh, FDA's intent uh, with the UDI rule. And it really is around post-market surveillance. And if you've seen any of the documents that have come out of FDA Center for Devices in the past couple of years around their post-market surveillance activities, you'll see front and center to that uh, is the implementation of UDI and the use of UDI in other clinical information systems, electronic health records, claims, uh, et cetera. And so it's important as you're developing uh, your own UDI programs and, and processes that you keep in mind uh, really what FDA's intent was around visibility and traceability of a particular device throughout its entire life cycle. Um, so being able to document, for example, uh, devices that were used on patients, uh, being able to document in patients' electronic health record which devices were used or implanted in that patient at a UDI level is critical to the success of, of FDA's post-market surveillance program. So again, critical to keep in mind FDA's real intent in this, there are obviously I showed a number of other benefits in the previous slide, but the real intent here is is visibility and traceability to support post-market surveillance, whether that's adverse event reports, being able to aggregate adverse event reports, recalls, uh, documentation again of, of device use or implantation in electronic health rec records or registries. Uh, that really is the focus, and so whatever you do to apply UDI to your device, um, it's critical that you. Um, do that in a way that is, is going to uh, support those activities. <clears throat> Excuse me, one second. Um, I did mention briefly the work that has gone on at what is now the International Medical Device Regulators Forum. Uh, started out as the Global Harmonization Task Force. A lot of good work in developing a globally harmonized approach to UDI. Um, I encourage you, if you have not taken a look at uh, the most recent guidance document published from IDR, IMDRF in December of last year, uh, you take a look at that. Um, it provides, for a couple of reasons, it provides um, some additional insight uh, into how UDI can be applied to, for example, software or complex configurable medical devices. Um, it also shows some differences that have started to evolve between the U.S. system and where other regulators are going. Um, so you'll see some subtle, not major, but subtle differences between how I believe UDI will be implemented, for example, in Europe uh, versus how UDI, or at least the UDI rule, is constructed in the U.S. So some subtle differences. Um, the, the, the guidance document published in December is also useful because it, it provides a fairly linear description of UDI, uh, which is helpful for those folks who maybe haven't been that paying that much attention to it or are not that familiar with it. Uh, the document provides a very linear discussion of UDI and all of its components, uh, which is a great sort of beginning document if you're trying to figure out what UDI is and, and how it works. Um, so I'm going to talk primarily about two work streams that, that we describe and when we work with clients. 
Uh, the first, first work stream is really around assigning device identifiers to products, creating UDIs on the labels of products and, and higher levels of packaging, and dealing with the standardized date format that we'll talk about in a moment. And then the second work stream is really all around the, the metadata and the metadata activities and the development and submitting that data <clears throat> eventually to, to FDA's a global unique device identifier database. <clears throat> so uh, the GUDID is pronounced good ID. So if I mention that, I'm referring to FDA's <clears throat> UDI database. Um, in FDA's UDI rule, um, in addition to all of the UDI requirements, FDA also required what we call the standardized date format. So any date that is intended to be brought to the attention of the user needs to be put into this uh, specific ISO 8601 format. And you can see there that it's an all numeric four digit year dash two digit month dash two digit day format. Again, this is any date, typically an expiration date or manufacturing date <clears throat> that is intended to be brought to the attention of the user needs to be in this standardized date format. Uh, the compliance dates are, are the same as the UDI compliance dates. Um, and you can see there that if the device is not subject to UDI, and there are a number of devices that are not, <clears throat> and we'll talk more about that in a moment, um, that, that you are still subject to the standardized date format. It's also important to note that there are various packaging levels that may also be exempt from UDI. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, and even if that occurs, um, you're still subject to the standardized date format. So keep in mind, the standardized date format really is a separate requirement. It happens to be contained within the UDI rule, but it's a separate requirement that applies to, to essentially the labels of all and labels and packaging of all medical devices, whether or not they are subject to UDI. <clears throat> um, so just to level set everyone, let's talk briefly about what is a unique device identifier or UDI. Um, it contains two parts. It contains what we call the device identifier, which is the static portion, identifies a particular manufacturer's product, a particular version or model at a particular packaging level. Uh, analogous to uh, NDC, National Drug Codes in the U.S., analogous to UPC codes that we see in retail. Um, so, a, you know, a, a very a concrete concept that's used by other industries. And then we have production identifiers, which are those control mechanisms, those control, those production identifiers uh, that are currently used by manufacturers that are currently on the label of, of products. Um, we typically see four. We typically see a, a lot or serial number, sometimes both, an expiration date and or a manufacturing date. And if any or all of those or whatever combination of those are on the label of the device, then they need to also be part of the UDI. You can't pick and choose which ones you want to use. Um, and note there, of course, um, UDI does not require manufacturers to change the way they control their products. So if you currently have a lot controlled product, it, do, it does not mean you need to serialize that product now. However you are currently controlling that product, whatever production identifiers you're using, whatever production identifiers are on the label, um, are the ones that need to be part of the UDI. Um, what the rule says, and it actually says this verbatim, <laughs> so, uh, and it's important to keep this in mind as you're working through, again, your own UDI uh, procedures and, and SOPs, um, that the label of every device must have a UDI. Um, now, it's important to think about label, even though there is a definition there. Uh, it's important to think about the label not as a physical thing, but as a regulatory concept. So the label is where other regulatory information goes. If you need to add another label in order to put UDI on your device, that's fine too. It doesn't need to go on the label that is currently there. Uh, I know that label space can be uh, quite a constraint for many at this point. So if you need to put another label on, that's fine. Um, it then goes on to say that every device package or higher level of packaging needs to have its own UDI. And again, this is fairly basic um, you know, supply chain logistics management kind of activities. And this supports uh, the legislative mandate that UDI identify a device through distribution and use. So the label of every device and every higher level of packaging needs its own UDI. Now we'll talk about a number of exceptions and alternatives of the rule. The rule provides quite a few of these. But again, it's important as you're working through how UDI applies to your particular devices that you keep in mind that this is where you need to start. You need to start with the UDI general rule and then work your way backwards or, or out of that uh, to wherever you land with your particular device and whatever exceptions or alternatives you might use uh, to, to apply UDI. 
Um, we often get this question, and, and I just want to, to spend a minute or so on this concept of labeler. Um, now, in we typically talk at, at or when FDA typically talks, other regulators typically talk about a medical device manufacturer. Um, the UDI rule introduced a new concept called a labeler, and this was because the concept of manufacturer was too broad from a UDI perspective. There are many, many actors that are considered uh, manufacturers from a uh, US FDA's perspective, for example, contract sterilizers or importers, um, who will not have any UDI responsibility. So the concept of labeler was introduced to say that the labeler, the person who causes the label to be applied to a device, is the one who is responsible for UDI. And you'll see here there's, there's often these cases, as in this label here, where there are a number of, of players, that there are these business relationships that exist between manufacturers and distributors or multiple manufacturers, um, and you'll end up with a label that looks something like this with multiple names on it. Um, and the question often arises, well, who is the label of the device? And FDA to date and has not provided, and I don't believe that they ever will, provide any more insight into who should be or who should not be the labeler of the device. It is really up to you, working with your, your strategic business partners in this case, to decide who is going to be responsible for UDI. Somebody has to assure that there is a UDI compliant uh, barcode, if you will, on the, on the label and on the higher levels of packaging, and somebody needs to assure that the appropriate metadata is, is submitted to the good ID. But it doesn't matter to FDA who that is, and it could be that different people have different roles. It, it, it's, that's okay. So uh, just keep that in mind as you're working through or if you're in any of these situations where you're either private labeling or, or someone is private labeling for you, uh, somebody has to be the labeler, and it's important to document that moving forward. Um, so, sort of the, the high-level view of UDI, now what do you actually need to do? Um, you need to work with one of FDA's accredited issuing agencies. Uh, you can see the alphabet soup of organizations listed there. Um, you can work with one or more of these uh, standards organizations, FDA doesn't care. Um, this is in contrast to, say, FDA's National Drug Code where you would come to FDA and get a company prefix and build out the rest of the NDC based on FDA's rules. Um, in this situation, um, in order to promote uh, global harmonization, uh, FDA has accredited these global standards organizations. Uh, the idea here, again, if you go back to the IMDRF guidance, uh, the idea here is that each regulatory domain as they implement UDI would follow essentially the same path, would pick uh, this group of, of global standards organizations, and then once the UDI is created by the device manufacturer, it could be used in any regulatory domain. So again, you need to work with one of these organizations, obtain a company prefix, and then uh, assign device identifiers to all of your products, um, including kits and software and configurable products, and you know everything that is a medical device needs a UDI. Um, in the latter half of the slide there, you can see that there is a discussion of when a new DI is required, so what changes require a new device identifier. Um, there's essentially three. If you make changes to a device um, and you treat that new device as a new version or model, then you need to create a new device identifier. Uh, if you relabel a product or you create a different device package, then you need to create a, a new device identifier for that product. Um, so you've created your device identifiers. Now you need to put them on the label of the device. We talked about DIs and TIs already. Um, on the label of the device is where those two ideas come together. Uh, the device identifiers that you've assigned and the production identifiers that are currently on the label come together into the UDI. Um, it needs to be in plain text or, or human readable, um, and it needs to be encoded in some form of, of AIDC technology linear barcodes, two-dimensional barcodes, RFID. FDA did not limit or constrain or suggest any technologies that could be used. It just said you need to put it in an appropriate AIDC technology um, as per your issuing agency. Um, in addition to the label requirements that, that I've just described, there's also uh, what we call direct marking requirements. So for those devices that are intended to be reused, so you as the device manufacturer intend them to be used more than once, and that need to be reprocessed between patient use, need to have the UDI on the device itself, again, called direct marking. Um, and that covers a very wide array of products that get cleaned or cleaned and disinfected or cleaned and sterilized between patient use. 
again, in addition to the label requirements, you need to have a UDI on the device itself, again, to promote traceability of the device throughout its life. Um, I just want to point out that direct part marking is a subset of technologies that is used. This is not a, the requirement from the US FDA UDI rule is not direct part marking, but rather direct marking. Again, you need to have a UDI on the device. Uh, it may be that you um, actually fulfill this requirement by direct part marking using a certain subset of technologies, but that is not a requirement. So important to distinguish between those two ideas. Um, there are a number of exceptions, um, and I'm not going to go through all of them. I, I encourage you to, to take a look at the, the rule for these. Um, custom devices, investigational devices that aren't otherwise on the market, veterinary devices, a whole slew of them. Uh, but I do want to draw your attention to, to a couple because I think they're very important and very powerful uh, for manufacturers as they're implementing UDI. Um, a couple here just to, to start off with. Uh, the first is that class one, hopefully everyone is aware that there are three pre-market risk classes of devices in the US, uh, class one being the lowest risk devices. And what the UDI final rule says is that class one devices do not need to incorporate UDI, uh, the production identifiers into the UDI of the device. So again, we've got device identifiers and production identifiers. Uh, so for a class one device, the device identifier alone, the static portion, uh, is sufficient. You don't need to encode lot or, or, or expiration date in the, in the UDI itself. Um, there's also a group of what are called good manufacturing practices exempt, GMP exempt, class one devices. Uh, these are very low risk devices that the FDA classified as being GMP exempt. Um, and they, those devices are also exempt from UDI. Uh, there is a list on FDA's website, uh, www.fda.gov backslash UDI, and you can see a list of these 400 or so device types by product code, um, and if your device is on that list, then you are exempt from UDI, still subject to the standardized state format. Um, there's also an exception for what what is called existing inventory. Uh, so for those devices that are manufactured, packaged, and labeled prior to the compliance date, FDA has said you have an additional three years to run through those products, existing inventory, before the devices need to be UDI compliant. So it gives you an opportunity to run through um, your existing inventory before you need to start to relabel uh, those, those particular products. Um, so I want to do a deep dive on a couple of, of exceptions here. Um, the first is uh, what we call the single-use device packaging exception. Um, so the idea here is you've got a box of 10 bandages. Each bandage, each sterile bandage is individually packaged. Uh, what the single-use device packaging exception says is that you don't need to put the UDI on the individual bandage. You can put it on the next higher level of packaging on that box of 10 or shelf packer or whatever you call that. Um, a very useful, very powerful exception uh, applies to all risk classes, class one, class two, class three, so any of those. Um, you can see, though, that there are three criteria that are listed there. It's important if you are going to take advantage of this exception that you document that you understand that your device meets these three criteria, or maybe you can say four. Uh, it does not apply to implants. Uh, if you're not sure whether your device is classified as an implant from FDA's perspective, you can ask FDA and they will tell you. Um, not everything that you might think is an implant, believe it or not, from your perspective, uh, is actually classified as an implant from FDA's perspective. So I important to understand that moving forward. But again, a very powerful exception, uh, particularly in the class one and class two space where we have a lot of low cost items that are you know, distributed in, in boxes or, or, or shelf packs. Um, I, I do want to mention, um, before I jump to the next slide here, that you will notice, for example, in the IMDRF guidance, um, uh, Europe was quite concerned about the single-use device packaging exception, and so at least in the discussions we had in the development of that guidance, um, they wanted to limit, uh, and this is one of the differences, they wanted to limit who could use that packaging exception to the lower risk class devices. Um, so they, it was limited to 1 and 2A, I believe. Um, and so, again, some of the subtle differences we might see coming about as different regulatory authorities start developing their own UDI systems. Um, on slide 21, uh, there is what we call a kit exception, and, and it, this is intended to be a very broad concept. And it essentially says that as long as you put a UDI on that kit or that tray or that set or that combination product, whatever, um, then the individual components or the device constituent parts of that thing uh, do not need to have a UDI. Um, again, <clears throat> going back to sort of first principles here, 
Um, the notion is that as long as you have traceability of, of what is in that kit or that set or that combination product, which you as the manufacturer have, um, and as long as the UDI is on that kit, then you have traceability uh, throughout the life cycle of that device. So again, as long as the UDI is on that kit, and I would encourage you to think of this quite broadly, um, then you don't need to put UDIs on the individual components uh, within that kit or that tray. Again, a, a very, very powerful exception being used by number of different uh, uh, of the, of the sub-sectors of the device industry today. Um, another, uh, and so that's it on the exceptions. I do want to uh, draw your attention to a few examples. Um, hopefully you can read this. It's quite small on my screen, but maybe a little bit larger on yours. Uh, there is, um, this is a box that's been opened, and we can see that, so let's just focus on sort of the, the upper left-hand corner here. We can see that there's a, a linear barcode, um, and this is a UDI built according to the GS1 standard, and there's a whole bunch of information below that linear barcode. Uh, this is called a concatenated linear barcode. Um, and if we can read, if you can, I can't, but if you can read the information below the barcode, you'll see that there's a parenthetical 01 and 14 digits that follows. Uh, that's the device identifier. Um, there's a parenthetical uh, 21, which as you can see, if you look up with the information above is a serial number, and a parenthetical 17, which is the expiration date of the product. Um, again, this device has an expiration date and serial number on it. Those are its production identifiers. Therefore, that's the information that must be encoded um, in the UDI. Uh, another example uh, works uh, similarly to, to the previous example. This, again, is a GS1 uh, built uh, UDI. But in this case, we can see that there's two linear barcodes. Uh, the top barcode uh, contains the device identifier. Again, 01 and 14 digits, that's the device identifier. And the bottom barcode contains the production identifiers. Uh, again, parenthetical 17 uh, is, is the expiration date, and we can see a parenthetical 10, and the information that follows is the lot number. Again, we can see there's a lot number and expiration date on this product, and therefore that's the information that's encoded in the UDI. Um, FDA doesn't have an opinion at this point about use of one barcode, two barcodes, three barcodes. Uh, you know, it's really a discussion you need to have with the, the issuing agency that you're using about the, the best way to go. In the lower right-hand corner of this, um, of this label, we can see a, a bunch of uh, black and white boxes. Uh, that's a two-dimensional data matrix. We're starting to see more and more of these. We're going to probably see more and more of these, particularly in the U.S. as the, as the work in the pharmaceutical space plays out. Um, and we're seeing a number of device manufacturers using data matrix as well. It can be made much smaller, uh, very robust, and quite a bit of information there. Uh, the next example is a UDI built according to the HIVIC standard. Again, we've talked about three issuing agencies. Um, works very similar to the GS1 example. Top barcode contains the device identifier. Bottom barcode, because this device contains a lot number and expiration date, then that information is in that secondary barcode. In the HIBIC standard, just as in the GS1 standard, you could have encoded this into a single linear barcode. You could have encoded this into a data matrix. Um, you know, the, the, the standard is, is fairly, the standards are relatively technology neutral, um, and so you can use different uh, technologies with each of them. And so you may find that on different levels of packaging, you may end up putting different barcodes. We're actually seeing this as potentially a requirement in some countries. Um, so, you know, again, understand how your users are going to use the technology um, and, and make appropriate choices from there. Um, the, finally, there is uh, this example here where we talk about uh, those uh, tissue products that are regulated as devices. In that case, uh, there is a standard by ICCBBA called ISBT-128. Again, I apologize for the alphabet soup. Um, but you can see there in, in underneath production identifier on slide 26, um, a discussion of donation identification number. Um, and this is very important from a tissue tracking perspective. So if you are a manufacturer of tissue products that are regulated as medical devices in the U.S., I encourage you to reach out to ICCBBA to understand how ISBT-128 can be used uh, for UDI uh, because it also then uh, fulfills a number of tissue tracking requirements as well. So we've talked about work stream number one, um, the label of products, creation of device identifiers, putting UDIs on the labels, dealing with standardized date format, all of that. So that's, that's actually the easy part. And now we get to the fun part, which is really submitting data to FDA's uh, good ID, Global Unique Device Identifier Database. 
Um, uh, what I want to point out in this slide it really is that there are two ways, essentially, for manufacturers to submit data to the database. Uh, you can either do it through a web-based uh, user interface, username, password, log on, cr manage your account, create records, edit records. There's, there's a, a tremendous amount of power in, in the web-based user interface, <clears throat> and you create and submit one record at a time. Um, there's a lot that you can do there, but again, if you've got uh, a couple dozen, a couple hundred products, it's probably a reasonable path to go down. If you've got thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of products and need to submit those number of DI records um, one at a time manually is probably not the way to go. So there is the option of submitting uh, electronically through FDA's electronic submission gateway using the Health Level 7 Structured Product Labeling, or HL7 SPL standard. Um, and there are a number of, of vendors out there that can help you with that as well. A um, number of third parties that if you need an electronic solution but don't have the capabilities in-house to develop one, uh, that they can help you do that. There is a ton of information about the Good ID on FDA's website. I encourage you. Uh, they recently published the final guidance. The draft guidance came out with the publication of the final rule, uh, but the final guidance came out uh, a couple of odd two weeks ago. Uh, so it's been published. There's been an updated list of data elements. Um, there's a HL7 SPL implementation guide. Tremendous amount of information there as well as uh, other resources and the ability to ask FDA questions. So if you're struggling with the good ID end, um, you know, and you need some help from FDA, please feel free to reach out to them. I'm sure they'd be uh, happy to help you. Um, the next slide is going to describe uh, at a very high level all of the data attributes that are part of a device identifier record. Not all of them are mandatory. Some are voluntary, some are conditionally mandatory, depending on how certain things are answered. Um, and then some can be changed in the future, some can't, some can only be added to. So there's a whole set of business rules that goes along with that. Again, there's a, uh, on FDA's website, there's a document uh, that describes all the data attributes, their definitions, lists the values and business rules around them. Uh, if you have not, I encourage you to take a look at that document to understand uh, what needs to be developed and, and, and what you need to do to move forward uh, with the good ID. Um, if you have not started this process, I will tell you that this is by far the most difficult aspect, I think, for most manufacturers of becoming UDI compliant. Uh, the data often doesn't exist uh, in a discrete location. It may not even exist uh, electronically. It may only exist in, on a label or in a submission of some sort. So you're going to have to go and find all of the information, um, figure out who owns it, what format it's in. Um, and then actually create a, a way of storing this information, of collecting it, of normalizing it, of validating it. Um, so there's a lot of work that needs to go into uh, all of the efforts to, to collect, uh, validate, and finally submit the data uh, to Good ID. And so, I, again, if you have not, I encourage you to take a look and, and start uh, working on that as well. Um, this goes back to a conversation I had a couple slides ago. There are a number of ways in which you can get data in. Uh, the top two work streams represent, the top work stream represents a web-based interface solution. Uh, the bottom represents a manufacturer's developed HL7 SPL solution. In between uh, represent a number of solution providers that are out there. Uh, this slide came compliments of Reed Technologies. They offer a solution as do a number of other vendors. So if you're, if you're unsure about where to, to move in this space, I encourage you to reach out to them or uh, reach out to us if you'd like as well. We're happy to help you um, make some decisions about this as well. Finally, we get to compliance. Um, everything is based off uh, or triggers off the, the publication of the final rule, which was September 24th of last year. So class three devices need to be UDI compliant by September 24th of this year. Uh, the 2015 date is what we call the FIDASIA timeline. So it requires all implants and life supporting, life sustaining devices to be UDI compliant by September 24th of 2015. There's a list on FDA's website of all of these, uh, of, of these devices that, that fit the FIDASIA timeline by product code. So if you're unsure, if your class one or class two device is, for example, life supporting or life sustaining, uh, you can take a look at that, uh, that list and determine whether or not you're subject to 2015 or, or 2016. 
and you can see uh, the rest of the compliance dates uh, flow out from there. Again, September 24th um, of, of those years is when UDI compliance for those classes become uh, effective. Um, I'm not going to spend any time on these last few slides. I just want to leave them with you. Understand that uh, there are a number of conforming amendments, changes made to other regulations in order to incorporate UDI, MDRs, recall. So as UDI becomes available, FDA expects that you will use UDI to identify the device, just as FDA is going to. And then finally, there's um, a couple of slides here at the end that talk about UDI compliance. I've really left them with you uh, to help you understand how to move forward. Uh, the last uh, few slides really talk about activities that you need to undertake as a device manufacturer in order to become UDI compliant, slides that we use with clients uh, as, as we work with them to become UDI compliant. Um, and I encourage you to take a look at these, and, and particularly this last one, which is kind of a summary of everything, um, and figure out where you are uh, and, and what activities you need to undertake to become UDI compliant. And with that, I thank you all very, very much for your time and patience. Again, my contact information is here. If you have any questions um, or would like to ch chat about anything UDI related, please feel free to reach out to me. And with that, I would like to turn this over to Hal Plant and uh, take it away, Hal. All right. Thank you very much, Jay. Uh, good to speak with you all today, Jay. Uh, thank you again for sharing a wealth of information. Um, every time I hear you speak, there's always something else, another nugget that I, uh, I get out of it. So it's a, it's a big picture to, to understand and learn and, and take into consideration on a labeling operation. So I uh, thank you again for being a, a great source of information for all of us to, uh, to look to as the uh, UDI rock stars, as, as you're well known as being. So um, as Anita mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, I'm going to um, be speaking about UDI as it relates to the bigger picture of the overall labeling lifecycle management um, process. So the introduction of the FDA's directive for UDI is just the latest in a long line of regulations designed to enhance patient safety and improving the product recall process in the event of any future safety issues. And, and likely this will not be the last regulation of, of its kind. I'm sure we can all agree that this is a revolutionary time for medical device labeling. UDI is the most significant regulatory change of its generation. And we can now begin to see that this promises to have some far-reaching downstream implications in the supply chain, as Joey spoke to, from whether it's unit labeling up to the different levels of packaging and getting uh, things out to market. Prior to UDI, there was not a regulation from the FDI for uniquely identifying devices in the supply chain. The result really was product recalls were very inefficient. Uh, they were very difficult to, to manage and execute. They were very complex. And they were really more costly because they were so wide sweeping, trying to not sure exactly of the product that was shipped to market is affected by that, by that recall. And all this was leading really to a negatively impacting patient safety and, and consumer confidence. The UDI is going to improve our ability to identify and track medical devices with much greater efficiency, accuracy, consistency, and visibility. This will be accomplished by UDI, which will require us to present product information in a standard format, making trade, distribution, and usage more secure and safe. The implementation of the standardization of the common UDI will undoubtedly increase visibility and improve the quality of information in the medical device adverse event reports, as Jay spoke to. It's going to help us to improve traceability within the supply chain and reduce potential errors by means of consistent, unambiguous, and harmonized data. So in the bigger picture, to make this work effectively, the UDI program must also facilitate the storage and the exchange of data between the healthcare stakeholders. Uh, broad adoption and use amongst the manufacturers, your suppliers, distributors, healthcare providers, and the patients will be central to the success of the UDI. So what does this mean for the medical device manufacturer? If you're not properly equipped with a carefully conceived UDI strategy plan, appropriate technology, and the necessary team resources, you may face a, a potentially daunting task for modifying or enhancing your current labeling process in time to be UDI compliant based on your product types and classifications. So here we are in the middle of this revolution, surrounded by a mixture of essential business systems and processes which support your operations. And due to this revolution, the days of an organization's perception that all oh, labeling is just a label, those days have passed. Product labeling is now a greater and more critical impact on your business more than ever before. In meeting this regulation effectively, your labeling operations could potentially evolve into a significant value add for your business on many fronts. 
I believe there's four things to keep in mind when preparing a strategy to best manage your labeling life cycle operations. And today, more specifically, to prepare for me and the UDI regulation. First thing is ask yourself, is my labeling operation CFR Part 11 compliant? Meaning, is your labeling operation validated as a closed, secure environment utilizing electronic records, security protocols, electronic signatures, which are captured in a single record of truth as to what critical actions have occurred within your labeling operations? Keep in mind the record within your single record of truth only extends as far as what you're able to capture in your validated Part 11 compliant environment. So a little side note, if you cannot capture that action or a historical version of a record in your single record of truth, can you actually prove the action occurred or the version of the record actually existed as claimed? And if you can, how easily and timely could you respond to an FDA auditor? I think we all want the auditors to be in and out as quickly as possible and leave with a smile. Uh, so in best practices world, CFR Part 11 compliance should be the backbone for any medical device labeling environment. Second point, ask yourself, are my labeling processes well defined and documented and supported with the technology which removes the unnecessary risk and reliance upon the human decision or, or indecision and manual or redundant entry by the human where possible? This is not about the actions to design and print a label. It's about the, the, those incremental steps that occur throughout your entire labeling workflow. So as each person is involved in your labeling operations, own their piece of the puzzle. When taking a step back from my conversations, many are amazed at the number of steps or actions today that are needed to take place. From the time a new label or data record is created to the time the actual production print occurs, and the time in which is consumed in doing so. Now, what, is, what if one of those steps or many of, the, many of those steps or a few of those steps are missed in the workflow? What would be the result of the impact of incorrect labels or data getting out to the production environment or distribution center or submitted up to the good ID? So this really takes us to the third element, which is control. The FDA is essentially going to require that we achieve a zero defect result when it comes to UDI labeling. Over the years, zero defect labeling, no offense to anybody in marketing, it's been a nice marketing buzz phrase. Everybody claims zero defects, and that, that's the goal. The concept is terrific and most certainly desirable, but we're no longer talking about concept, nor are we talking about desire. We are talking about unique device identification and the FDA's requirement to be compliant. So now when it comes to the data, it is absolutely necessary to think about control. UDI is about the data, and to get that right, data is all about control. If you can't control your system access and user permissions, if you can't control the process, if you can't fully enforce your standing operating procedures, then you can't control the data. And you're opening yourself to risk of noncompliance to UDI, or worse, potentially patient harm. So standing operating procedures are nice. We create them. We train our team to follow them. We have great expectations that everyday things are being done as they should. Um, the life science sector is, is more than an industry. We're really a collective community where regulations, standards, and quality management guidelines are woven into our everyday life of policies and procedures. So we do our best to enforce our SOPs. If the perfect SOP was written and followed 100% of the time, we would likely live in a world without labeling errors, which result in recalls and CAFAs, but we don't. Industry statistics regarding labeling errors in our community don't lie. Managing the process without fault to error is critical to UDI compliance, and it is managing the process, which is the foundation to it's all about the data. So we all know that there are currently, give or take, based on, as Jay mentioned, your business rules, about 56 data attributes to manage and submit to the good ID, in addition to the seven or so attributes which are derived by the FDA. So there's, there's a lot of things that we're capturing in that database, as we know. So while UDI is in the forefront of our collective minds, we still need to keep an eye on that bigger picture, and obviously it's a picture that includes UDI. It is not uncommon for a medical device manufacturer to have a significant, if not an astonishing number of products or potential kit configuration possibilities which can be shipped across the uh, global market. So the number of unique data elements per product, per order, or per destination can be staggering. So during this revolutionary time, we're thinking about UDI readiness and compliance, and the organizational spotlight is shining bright and hot on your labeling operations, I believe most in our community are closely assessing their labeling processes, their labeling software, and system control mechanisms. In doing so, 
and I stress this, I suggest this is a good time to think beyond UDI date elements and UDI compliance dates. This is an optimal time to look at how your other labeling data elements are being managed and controlled as part of your overall labeling operations. As Jay mentioned, the, da the data, if, if not in an accessible, usable, or standardized, or well-formatted manner, is, go is going to make UDI readiness challenging. Beyond UDI, trying to manage data, whether it lives in a static label or disparate business systems or in an Excel sheet that's uncontrolled, can, can really cause havoc in trying to manage your operations when it really is all about the data. So um, how are you managing things such as your country specific or regional demands such as required symbols, required barcode symbologies, uh, barcode standards, um, as Jay mentioned, maybe on different packaging, that, could, that those could vary. And you translated uh, specific words or terms or phrases for both your labels and, and also your IFUs. So what I mean is much of what we're preparing for UDI now, what are your existing change control processes mechanism for reacting to regulatory changes wherever and whenever they may be coming from around the globe. In making the necessary adjustments or labeling management improvements to prepare for your own UDI regulation appears to be a daunting task. So it's really how systematically flexible or equipped are you to respond in time when other countries you ship product to enact a due date for their own regulatory labeling requirements. We all know they will and we always know they're going to change. Managing these types of changes due to new regulatory demand should not be an unnerving nor an overwhelming event. It should be a seamless transition by affecting systematically controlled modifications to labels, your label data, and perhaps some processes as needed without causing significant interruption to labeling management or your supply chain operations. Essentially, for a metal device manufacturer, likely with global reach in the global market and operations, having the ability and flexibility to manage country-specific or, or regional-specific information without derailing or affecting the label of data which is used for another country is critical. In all my years in the medical device labeling arena, no one has ever questioned the incredible level of dynamic variability in both product assortment and localized market demands which device manufacturers need to juggle. It can be very challenging. So while the corporate spotlight is likely on your labeling operations during these revolutionary times, this is a great opportunity to assess your current state and identify a plan to make the future state best equipped to deal with the challenges of today, such as preparing for UDI, and what may be coming from other parts of the world and probably not in the not too distant future. Now diving a bit deeper into controlling the process. When Jay and I, um, we spoke about this topic back in February, uh, chilly February uh, in Boston at a medical device summit, part of the discussion or presentation was about the difference between restricted and controlled. In order to achieve necessary control in a highly dynamic and, and typically a global labeling environment, it is critical to be aware of the key differences between restricted and controlled when it comes to your label management processes and your label data. So to be conscious of time, um, there's a, probably a hundred stories I, could be, I probably could probably share with you today and probably a million more you can share back with me. Uh, I'll speak to a single scenario. Re restricted implies that a certain individual have been granted access to the database where your label data may reside. Restricted access to things such as your GTIN numbers, your product codes, your product descriptions, and things like that. By having restricted access to that data means that those with the access rights have the ability to presumably and the responsibility to manage this data. This also means these folks with restricted access could make accidental changes. Or in one case I'm thinking of right now, this person made a well-intended change to a critical UDI data element which was neither authorized nor correct. This action resulted in a severe labeling error, which was only noticed after labels with this information were applied to the product or the production floor and shipped to a remote distribution center. So this brings us back to discussing SOPs and CAPAs further, but you know, we'll, we'll move forward from, away from that and, and continue here with uh, uh, regarding the, um, uh, the best practices. So as you can see, this is one shared scenario, simply restricting access to certain folks does not protect your data from being changed and used by production print operators, whether properly or improperly. Having defined and enforceable electronic change controls, review cycles, and approval procedures in place, perhaps to the escalating workflow protocol, are the key differences between restricted and controlled data and process management. So a control process allows the ability to enforce who can create data records, who can review and approve data records, who can then release those data records to the print operators, and then in time, who can create a new version of a record and so forth. And that's where part 11 comes in to play with managing electronic records is, is capturing in your audit trail the, the difference in variations of versions of, of 
your information and being able to prove that to the FDA if needed or for your own internal auditing purposes. Labels and data live in a state of change. Managing these changes over time is critical to maintaining the integrity and the accuracy of your product labels. So just as important as achieving optimal labeling management in regards to the production print of your product labels, taking this step further down the line to ensure UDI compliance, the integrity of this data is critical where applicable to the UDI data attributes which will be submitted to the good ID, data which will be forever associated to that device. Now dialing back the control discussion a little more closely to the UDI data elements, um, keep in mind that the um, required integrity of the UDI data is ultimately published to the good ID. Um, and the 57 or so elements managed by those persons who have permissions to create, approve, release, and version control of these data elements in a secure or controlled database. So as Jay mentioned, I won't get too deep into this, but we're talking about the device identifier, the product identifier. Again, the device identifier are the data elements which identifies a specific version or a model of a device and the label of that device. It is recommended to manage these data elements in a secure, closed, validated system which offers proper mechanisms to enter, review, approve, and systematically version control each data element. And same thing for the production identifier. The lot and batch number should be generated and controlled in the ERP system, and preferably data-driven at print time rather than rekeyed by the print operator. Other production identifiers such as your serial numbers, if, if you do serialize your product, uh, the date of manufacture, the expiry date, um, Jay mentioned the, the, the expiry date is its own reg, but it's, it's obviously tied to the UDI, should be generated and controlled in either an ERP system or a secure and validated labeling lifecycle management solution. Again, preferably not being keyed in by the print operator. Now, bringing everything together, the UDI barcode, the expiry date, and its proper format, both within the barcode and its own human-readable text field, and all of the data elements, including your product descriptions, ISO symbols, and images, a compliant label is produced, and the necessary correct information can be submitted to the good ID as required. A perfect, or shall I shall I say from the marketing folks, a zero defect label is more likely and best achieved when produced out of a properly managed and controlled labeling environment. And just as is important as the technology and the process to this success is the people behind the label. Sometimes when I speak with folks at medical device companies for the first time, they say, oh, no, no, I'm not involved with labeling. Um, well, to be honest, I'd be hard pressed to believe that each of us is not somehow connected to or responsible for the information printed on our labels considering the cross-functional efforts to produce that label from initial design all the way to print and apply. Um, I was at a medical device conference earlier this year and one of the speakers, uh, the keynote speaker actually, used a great line that stuck with me and, and, I, and it really sums it up for me and I'm hopefully not paraphrasing here, I believe I have it right on. A label is a contract between you and your customer, be it a healthcare provider or the patient. If you think about the label in that context, you, you quickly realize just how critically important it is for your company that the labeling is done without error and meets compliance. And knowing just how much cross-functional teamwork goes into creating, managing, and supplying the information that finds its way onto your label, in some way and to some degree, we're all responsible for contributing the data for the label. And when done right, one label at a time, uh, we should all take a slice of credit for that success. And, and uh, based on your operations, that could be anywhere from a, a few thousand to tens of thousands of, of, of slices of success every day. So again, not to beat a dead horse, but these are revolutionary times in, in a world of metal device labeling sparked by the UDI publication. This is an ideal time to up the game on your ability to find your, your enforce your standing operating procedures and the functionality through all your labeling operations. As recommended earlier, if you haven't done so yet, implementing the technology and security protocols to achieve FDA CFR Part 11 compliance is part of your UDI readiness overall labeling lifecycle management strategy will offer foundations and a good first step in controlling, managing, executing, and accounting for all actions within your labeling operations. Remember, it's all about the data. And this goes hand, hand in hand with managing and controlling the process. So when thinking about ensuring UDI compliance and all the dynamic data elements associated with UDI and all the people involved at each stage in the process, it is the right time to look at the big picture and assess objectively and plan your labeling operations accordingly. And in doing so, always be thinking about being positioned and equipped to respond to other potential or dare I say probable regulatory changes coming in the future from other countries. 
To that point, a uh, supply chain executive I know at a global medical device uh, manufacturer um, is always saying, think global, act global. And, and, um, and it's true. Uh, having that mindset in making the decisions on how we approach our labeling operations will keep us hopefully in the forefront and not being uh, feeling we have a, a very uh, daunting or nerve-wracking task ahead of us when something changes which is going to affect our labeling operations. But for today, it's about the UDI and the value it would op offer us in optimizing our post-market surveillance. As Jay mentioned, being able to react faster, more efficiently when product needs to be reclaimed from the market, the UDI will help us to minimize broad and costly recalls by helping to ensure patient safety. So before we get to the Q&A part of the webinar, I'd like to share some suggestions based on my experiences over the years in, in, in speaking with and in engaging with medical device manufacturers. First, understand the UDI timeline and how it affects your organization and your class of products. This is a key factor in developing a well-conceived and realistic UDI readiness plan. Next, thoroughly assess your labeling processes and labeling softwares systems in an objective manner to truly determine if you are ready for UDI, if you are as efficient as you can be, and if you're operating without unnecessary risks. You may find that although it's not broken, it needs to be fixed. So while lifting the hood to prepare for UDI, some of you may find opportunities to tackle some other strategic challenges head on, such as lowering your operational costs throughout your labeling operations. Using UDI, for example, for many will require making changes to current labels in order to comply. So thinking about affecting a global change across your labels for your product ship, uh, product to today, how long would it take you to manage a global change with the tools you and the procedures you have in place? And how much would this cost you both financially, but also in terms of getting things back out to market? Labeling is not a money maker. Never will be, unless you're a print shop. But if you're a medical device manufacturer, labeling is not a money maker, it's an expense. But when you manage everything properly, operational costs can be greatly reduced and perhaps reallocated to other parts of your growing business. So if you haven't started already, as Jay says, start now. Um, so that, that concludes my part of the presentation. I, I want to thank you all again for, uh, for listening. I hope I offered you some, some things to consider and think about. And, and I can't stress enough, be objective, really look at your labeling operations. And are you well positioned and ready for UDI when you need to be? But also in the bigger picture, as, as things are always changing, how capable and flexible are you to respond to those other changes without having to reinvent or, or have a, a, a serious derailment uh, within your supply chain due to labeling. Um, so at this point, uh, again, thank you. I'll pass this back over to Anita, and uh, we'll take it from here. Excellent. Thanks ever so much, Hal, and, and thanks also um, to Jay, who, who was speaking earlier. Um, so please do bear with us while we uh, go through some of the questions. We've, we've literally probably only got a couple of minutes um, to cover them. So don't worry if you did ask a question and we aren't able to answer it right now. We will provide um, written answers to the questions that have come in as well so you can get the, the help that you need. Um, I can see a couple of people have already asked about copies of the slides. Um, don't worry, there will be a copy of the slides and also the audio um, available shortly after the session, so look out for an email which will let you know um, how you can get hold of that information. Um, so if you do need further details, um, you can obviously visit our prismid.com website or the usdm.com website where you'll find a wealth of information, um, and you can also follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, so I'm literally just going to go through uh, a couple of the first questions that have come in. Um, There's probably one for, for Jay. Um, so the first question is, um, can you clarify the human readable aspect of the expiry date format for UDI? Um, sure. Thank you, Anita. It's a great question, and, and, I, and I'm sorry that I skipped over it in my presentation, but there is quite a bit of confusion uh, between uh, the the uh, standardized date format that I talked about, the four-digit year, dash two-digit month, dash two-digit day, which again is intended for a user to read and understand and use, uh, versus the information that is encoded in the UDI. So in, in each of the standards, GS1 and HIVIC, for example, there's um, uh, specific requirements for how dates are encoded. And that's fine. That's what the standards require, and so you should follow that. So. Um, the standardized date format, again, only applies to those dates that um, we typically see on labels up, say, next to an expiration, you know, it says expiry date or a little hourglass symbol. 
and follow whatever format. Um, so, for example, in the GS1 space, it's a it's a YYMMDD. If you saw next to that parenthetical 17 in some of the barcodes I talked about in Hibic, it has uh, some options, but essentially it's it's the same idea that they have ways of presenting expiration date in the standard, so that the standard. So people who are encoding and decoding are doing it the same, and that's not part of the standardized date format requirement. Excellent. Thanks very much for that, Jay. I'm um, just a little bit conscious of time, so I'm just literally going to squeeze in um, one more question. Um, so the next one, I think, would, would also, again, uh, be for you, Jay. Um,